If you would this morning, please open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. This morning we will conclude the sermon series that we have been in during uh, this month of September. A sermon series on what it means to be a part of a local church. Uh, I want to, though, as you're flipping in your Bibles, give you a preview of what uh, is coming up in the next couple of months. Lord willing, you know, that God can always change uh, situations and circumstances. But my plan for uh, teaching and preaching from the pulpit in October and November is this. I want to work through the Old Testament book of Micah. Now, I know the Old Testament book of Micah is the favorite of many of, uh, of you. Uh, it, it, it may not be one of our favorites. It's kind of hard to find even. It's right in the middle of, of the minor prophets, the, the last 12 books there in the Old Testament. But I, I was going through uh, Micah at about this time last year in my personal Bible study. And the Lord just put it on my heart that this would be a good message to study and, and preach from at this time, a year later, as we are, are heading into this election that so many people are concerned about, Micah speaks to us, speaks to us uh, when we're in difficult situations. And so that's coming up. Now we're gonna, of course, every passage of scripture in some way or another points to Christ. We'll be uh, taking a look uh, at, at Jesus. In fact, uh, the, the, the passage of scripture, the prophecy that says that Jesus is gonna be born in Bethlehem, that comes from Micah. And Jesus' second coming is actually mentioned in Micah, believe it or not. So there's plenty of Jesus in the book of Micah. I, I let you know that um, so that if you want to, you can read ahead and so you're not surprised. Uh, and and you, can, you, can, you can actually look up where Micah is so you're prepared next Sunday because it's, it's not the easiest book to find uh, in our Bibles. Okay, so we're in, in Romans chapter 12. Last week, we took a look at the first two verses. I'm going to read them again, and then from there, jump into this next passage, uh, starting with verse 3. So I, I'm beginning with the first verse, uh, read what we looked at last week, and then continue. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts with mercy, with cheerfulness. Okay, so last week we, we began this, this section here of, of Romans 12, and we saw that as followers of Christ, we belong to him and we uh, are to present our bodies, really all of our lives, as this living sacrifice to him that begins with us renewing our minds, meaning we reject the world and the mold that the world wants to shape us into, and we seek out the Lord and serve him. And we pointed out last week how it's important to be doing that within a fellowship of faith. And that leads us into what we've been talking about really th this whole month, what it means to be like, or what, excuse me, what it means to be a part of 
a fellowship of believers, a, a local church. And I have been sharing with you what is, I will admit, an eclectic mix of Scripture. But these, the, these Scripture passages that we've looked at have meant a lot to me as I have tried to figure out what, what it means for me to be a part of a local fellowship of, of, of believers, of a local church, uh, before I was a pastor and, and, and after I was a pastor. What did we look at? Well, we started with Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is no longer ourselves that are living. It is Jesus who is living within us. Our old person has been put to death and we are raised as new creations now. It's not about us anymore. It's about him. So... What does he desire? He desires us to live for him and to live for him in communication with other believers uh, in faith. And that leads us to the, the next passage that we looked at a, a few weeks back. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. Um, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, Jesus will return. But but our citizenship now is no longer really of this world. It is of heaven. And that means that we belong to the Lord, but we do not belong to him alone. We belong to him with our other brothers and sisters. Uh, I could have also included a great passage in, um, in Galatians 4 about how we, when we become believers, are adopted into the family of God, but, but we only had five Sundays in September, not six, so I didn't quite get that one in. Uh, after that, we took a look at what the early church looked like. If we're taking the church back to formula, what, what did that early formula look like? And we saw that in Acts chapter two, we saw a church that was living together, sharing everything together, sharing financial goods, certainly, but also sharing their lives with each other sharing their their skills and gifts and we're going to talk more about that in this passage and so forth and so on so we have seen that that the new life in christ is a new life in christ along with our sisters and brothers in the faith and that of course brings us up to what we're going to dive into here this morning so go to verse three if you will for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone. And then before he gets to what he's saying to everyone, let's take a look more closely at that statement that Paul leads with. For by the grace given to me. So what he's about to say, he is saying because of grace that God gave to him. Well, this is Paul. He is writing to the church there at Rome. Paul used to be a guy who went by the name of Saul. Saul was a Pharisee. He was a person who thought he knew the way to God better than anybody else, and he was going to impose that way or will on everybody else. And if you wouldn't conform to Paul ways of think, Paul's way of thinking, or Saul, excuse me, Saul, he was called at the time, his way of thinking, he would break you until one day Saul was on his way to Damascus to break some other people, and Jesus appeared to Saul and broke him. And he realized that even though he might be smarter than everybody else, more driven than everybody else, more talented than everybody else, he was still a sinner in need of forgiveness. And God had given him forgiveness through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it was the risen Christ that appeared to Saul. And, and, and the scales fell from his eyes, literally. This is the same grace that is given to us as believers. And so Paul says, it is through this grace that I address you, and it is through this grace that you are to hear what the Spirit is saying to you in the words that come next. We too have been forgiven uh, by God through the death 
of Jesus Christ on a cross as a, a perfect sacrifice for us. And, and his resurrection has drawn us to him through the cross. If we put our faith and trust in him, our sins are forgiven. We are gifted with the power of his spirit now. And we have life eternal, which begins now and becomes perfected in, in the future to come. So it is this grace that Paul is, is writing through and is this grace that we are listening with. Okay, so since we are listening because we have been made new creations in Christ, what are we listening to? Verse three again, for by this grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So what we are instructed to do here is not to think too highly of ourselves. Saul, before he became Paul, thought way too highly of himself. Jesus, in great mercy, broke him of that. And now he took a new name, his Latin name, Paul, and is taking this, this message of mercy and grace to the world. We too need to recognize that we ourselves also need Jesus Christ. This grace that's being talked about here by Paul, we need it too. We might be very intelligent, we might be very successful, we might be very driven, we might be all of those things. We are still sinners. We still need that grace, that mercy. And we need to think soberly of ourselves and recognize that we are sinners like everybody else. Now there's a flip side to this coin as well. So we might be tempted to think too highly of ourselves. We might also be tempted to think too lowly of ourselves. That there is nothing that we possess that anybody wants. Nobody likes us. Why would they? There's nothing we can offer to the church or to God. We, we can't do anything. We're not talented. This is not so. Both of these are lies that, that, that the evil one is whispering in our ear, that we're better than everybody else or that we're worse than everybody else. To, to believe such things is sinful. It, it is sinful. Uh, we, we can't do that. If you struggle with, with the opposite, that you think that there's no reason anybody would like you, you don't have any friends, there's nothing you can add to, this, to, 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 to any kind of mission or anything like this, let, let me tell you two ways in which you're wrong. Number one is this. The Lord thought so highly of you that before the foundation of the world, He created you. He thought you up. He wrote you down. Whatever, whatever metaphor for creation we want to use, he thought so much of you that he did that. And that's not me saying that. that. That's Ephesians chapter 1. That's right there in Scripture. And the other thing that the Lord has done for you is that he loved you so much that he came and died in your place to take your sacrifice, your punishment, that you might be remade more like the way God intended you to be, not weighed down by sin and guilt, but a new creation who has something to add to God's plan for creation and salvation. So we are to think soberly about ourselves correctly about ourselves we are not better than anybody else we are not below anybody else all have sinned and thank god he calls all of us to salvation in him okay so we need to think clearly about ourselves then he goes on to say verse four for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So 
when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's not just uh, for the purpose of, of us being saved. It's for the purpose of us building up this new family of faith that the Lord is putting together, the, the, the church. Here, Paul uses a metaphor for the church that he uses in, in, in some more of his writings. Uh, he uses it very briefly here in 1 Corinthians, he'll expand it. But that is the church is a body. A body is an organism that's made up of different parts. You know, we have heads, we have limbs, we have fingers, toes, we have an internal organs, all these kind of things. If something is wrong with any of that stuff, all of a sudden it's a crisis situation. Uh, Paul elaborates on this more in 1 Corinthians, but, but you, you get the picture, don't you? Uh, we might be tempted to think, well, the most important part of my body is my head. Uh, that's very tempting to think, unless like me in the past, you've had feet problems. When you have problems with your feet, you quickly recognize that the most important part of your body is your foot. Uh, but that's true of anything. If you have an issue with any part of your body, all of a sudden uh, it, it's a crisis now. Internal organs that you don't even know are there. If you have a problem with them, all of a sudden things are, are, are in bad shape. Such it is with the church. The church is made up of different individuals, but we're all a part of something bigger that the Holy Spirit has assembled. And if something isn't working right, it diminishes the entire body. If you are a part of a church, but you are not showing up that much, or you uh, are causing problems or this kind of thing, it, in, it impacts the whole rest of the body. And so the body is not operating as it should. Now, I'm going to take just a minute here and, and give a plug for something which I've been doing for the entirety of the month. Uh, out in the concourse there uh, on one of those tables is a sign-up sheet. If over the last few weeks, uh, as we've been talking about what it means to be a church member, you want to learn more about what it means to be a church member here at this church, I would invite you to go and, and sign up there. What we'll do is um, a number of you have signed up already. I'm going to reach out to you this week, probably via email, and try to set up some times that we can sit down and meet together. What's going to happen at those times uh, when, we, when we meet together, it, it might be, uh, I'll, try, I'll try to have a few of us together when we do that. What we'll do is I'll, I'll put the church bylaws in front of you and, and we'll go through this. It does a couple of things. It defines what it means to be a church member and the requirements for being a church member. Um, spoiler alert here, one of them is uh, a believer in Jesus Christ and a follower of Jesus Christ. Another one actually is that you, you have to sit down with a pastor and discuss what it means to be a church member. So that, that's a requirement too. That's why we do it that way. There's a couple other things that we'll go through there. And then the rest of it will describe how the church operates how we make decisions at the church, how we serve at the church, how we build a budget, th these kind of things. We'll, we'll go over all of that. And then I will, I will leave you with that information. You can take that information. You can pray about it. You can see what the Lord is leading you to do. There's no big sales pitch there. But that, that's, that, that's what we're going to do. And that information is out there. If uh, you don't sign up uh, th this week, um, you can certainly approach me later on if the Lord speaks to you then, and, and, and we can do that uh, as well. One other thing I'll mention about that is uh, built into our bylaws. We have two kinds of church membership. We have full membership, and we have an associate membership. The associate membership we put in there more specifically for people who are going to be in the area for uh, a limited period of time, a college student perhaps. And you don't want to forego your relationship with your home church, but want to establish an additional relationship with us. We have a means of doing that as well. So that's my plug. I'll, I'll um, uh, leave you to that. But that's what this entire month has in part been about. I am really interested though, and this is what we're going to look at as we go forward through the rest of this passage, in you being active in a local church, okay? If it's this church, wonderful. If it's another church, wonderful. But this is what we are called to do when we are called to be a part of Christ. We need to be a part of that body. 
And when we're not, there's a part missing from the body. Okay, verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are gifted with his spirit. His spirit now joins with our spirit and begins the process, we call it sanctification, of making us a little bit more like Christ each and every day. Uh, sometimes we can have great periods of growth. Sometimes it's, it's more slow and steady. But he is in the process of making us more like him. Something else happens uh, as well, though. We are gifted with unique gifts that help us serve him by serving the church. Oftentimes, these are referred to in church as spiritual gifts. We're going to mention a number of the spiritual gifts here as we go through the remaining verses this morning. As we do, I'm going to tell you about that gift, but I'm also going to share some generalities about the spiritual gifts as we go forward, okay? So the first would be what I just shared with you. If you become a follower of Jesus Christ, he gives you his spirit. His spirit is going to manifest within you uh, in, in various ways. Uh, you'll be able to exercise gift or gifts that, that uh, help to serve the church. So we, we see some generalities here already. One, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, his spirit is within us. His spirit is going to be active within us. That's going to express itself in gifts. Uh, number two, the gifts are for the use of the church. These are not the same thing as talents. Okay, we might um, be born with uh, certain talents and skills we develop. We might be good at drawing. We might be good at music. We might be good at computing numbers, these kind of things. That's all fine and good. That's not the same thing as a spiritual gift. Sometimes, in fact, I would say often our spiritual gifts are going to dovetail with the, the, the other um, talents that, that, that we have just as being a part of the human race. Um, I'll use myself as an example in, in, in a little bit, but this is something different. It's something different. Okay, let's take a look at the first one that is mentioned here. Uh, verse 6, having uh, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith. So the first one mentioned here is prophecy. Now, another generality I'm going to share with you at this moment is that here in um, Romans chapter 12, we have a listing of spiritual gifts, but it is not a complete list of spiritual gifts. In fact, there are four different lists that we see in the New Testament. All are given to us by Paul. Uh, we have this list here in Romans. We have two lists actually in, in 1 Corinthians. And then we have one in Ephesians as well. Some are more elaborate, listing more gifts. Some are, are more concise. The one in Ephesians is, is, is quite concise. This one is more concise as well. So what we see here is we don't have um, an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts. That has raised a question for us uh, as we study spiritual gifts. Uh, do we take the list that we have, the, those four lists, compile them and that makes an exhaustive list for us or is something else at play here well i tend to kind of straddle that a little bit uh, i think that when we put those lists together we get something close to an exhaustive list but it may not be entirely exhaustive so for instance music uh, musical talent that's not a spiritual gift and yet using those gifts to help lead worship to build us up this is a spiritual gift i think even though music isn't mentioned anywhere in any of these lists now we could perhaps slide it under another category like the category of encouragement which we do see in this list perhaps that's a way forward um, and we certainly we're probably better off doing that than trying to create new categories that we don't see in scripture i just say that that we perhaps don't have an absolutely exclusive list here or in the combined list even. So the first one mentioned is prophecy. What is prophecy? Well, 
Uh, I mentioned there's four different lists of scripture, uh, lists in scripture of spiritual gifts. Prophecy is actually mentioned in all four of them. Many are just mentioned in two, some are just mentioned in one, uh, but prophecy is mentioned in all four. What is prophecy? Well, prophecy is something that Paul is seeing in all of that first century church. Individuals who receive a direct word from God for that moment in time and for that church. Uh, words uh, that come directly from God in a supernatural way. Now, all of the working of the spiritual gifts are supernatural, but this one is more demonstrably supernatural, okay? Um, the question that this one raises for us is another one of those broad generalities about spiritual gifts that we need to tackle. Are some of these more spectacularly supernatural spiritual gifts? One thinks of prophecy, one thinks of speaking in tongues and these kind of things. Is this for the church all throughout time or was this something more specific for that first century church? Sometimes we hear this referred to as the cessation uh, uh, theory, that some of these have ceased after that first century church. Uh, well, what's my take on that? My take is it's complicated, <laughs> okay? That, that's my take there. Take prophecy, for instance. As I mentioned before, it's a specific word given for a specific time directly from the Lord. We see this in the book of Acts. There's a, an occasion where a, a man is given a word of prophecy to the churches that there's going to be a famine in the area of Jerusalem. The Lord tells the churches this so that they can take up a collection to help that struggling church in that moment. So it's a, a word of prophecy. Does this still happen? Well, it's complicated, I think. I think that it doesn't happen that much, but it's still the same spirit at work today. God can still do this. If God does this, we need to make sure that whatever word of prophecy is given, it doesn't go against what is in God's word, which brings me to why I think we don't see this exercise that much anymore. And the reason being is that we have this in our hands. My friends, this is a miracle, what we hold in our hands, the complete word of God. We have God's purposes in creation at the beginning of this. We have God's plan of salvation with Jesus Christ in the middle. And we have what is going to come to pass in the future, Jesus coming and remaking all things. So we have what we need to know right here. Now, does that preclude the Lord from some point in the future giving a specific word of prophecy? No, it doesn't. Of course he can do it. We don't need it as much as that first century church did. They had the Old Testament scriptures and they would teach from them. Uh, they would have word, uh, letters like, like from Paul, which they would read, but they didn't have the New Testament itself. It, it was being compiled during that time. So we have something they didn't have. And so uh, if you have a church or a church tradition today in which you have prophecy going on at every church service, I have to admit I'm a little skeptical of that. I have to admit I'm a little skeptical of that and want to remain uh, standing on this. Okay, so, so that is the first one mentioned here. It was active, more active as, as I mentioned in the first century world. Okay, verse seven. The next one mentioned is service. Here's another broad generality about spiritual gifts. Some of them are more uh, gifts that we have with people being up in front of other individuals. Um, some gifts are more background gifts, gifts that happen not really up in front uh, of everyone. But those background gifts aren't any less important they aren't any less important. In fact, Paul mentions here the gift of service before he mentions the gift of teaching, one of those up in front of people kind of gifts. I don't think he's ranking them in any way or shape here. They are all important. So what does the gift of service look like? It's mentioned in two of these lists. Um, in another list, it's referred to as the gift of helps. I think it's the same thing. It is when we are doing just the things that need to be done. We are, we are being servants to people in the church. Uh, 
Yesterday, we were at Paul B for their community day and we were serving hot dogs and snow cones and other things to the community. And we were helping each other set up and tear down and all that kind of stuff. And we were wearing t-shirts that said servant on the back. Okay, just in case we forgot who we are or what we are doing. Jesus is the greatest of all servants. If we are helping take care of, of children in a nursery, we are serving. If we are helping to fix a toilet during the week here at the church, we are servants. We are expressing these, these gifts of service. If we are, you know, uh, riding the van or driving the van over to pick up uh, college students to, to get them here for worship, we are exercising this gift of service. There's many different ways that we can do this. I think probably more people are gifted with this gift than any other gift in the church. And that's wonderful because we need it in all of its uh, shapes and flavors. So verse seven, if service in our serving and one who teaches in his teaching. So this is a gift that I think the Lord has given to me. Uh, I, I mentioned before that these are different than talents, but oftentimes the gifting dovetails with the talent. For instance, um, uh, before God called me to, to be a pastor, I, I could get up and, and speak in front of groups of people. Uh, public speaking is terrifying for most of us. I guess my uh, fear threshold there was like maybe 98% instead of 100%, which gave me a leg up on, on others. So, so that was something that, that I had, and I could have used that maybe teaching in high school or, 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 or some other way. But as a believer, with his spirit working in, in, within me, now his spirit is expressing itself with the gifting of, of teaching. Um, it, it could be that way with you that, that, that your spiritual gift really does dovetail with some other um, talents or, or skills that you have. But we have to realize that this is done for the church. That's why God empowers us with this spirit, for the church. Um, one of the benefits of, 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 of teaching, if that's your gift, is, is you get to really dig into the Lord's word. And, and that's what it means here. It is teaching God's word. That, that's really uh, the definition of, of the spiritual gift that we see in scripture. And that there are also downsides to that. Um, if you're a teacher of a small group, you know this as well as I do. Sunday morning waits for no one. You know, whether you're ready or not, Sunday morning shows up. And if you're teaching a small group, you, you know what I mean there. So there's the gift of teaching. Verse 8, one who exhorts in his exhortation. Uh, exhorts is the gift mentioned here. It is sometimes translated as encouragement or encourages. Uh, the, the Greek word can be translated either way. Uh, this is a, a wonderful gift. Perhaps you have been given the gift of encouragement. But I will say something about encouragement. You know, we need encouragement. Uh, some of us, as we're going through difficult times, we need encouragement, this kind of thing. But the gift of encouragement, that is not like little orphan Annie coming up on the stage and being in the spotlight and belting out, the sun will come up tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar. That's not what is meant by this gift of encouragement. What is meant by this gift of encouragement, and this is why we need to understand it could also be translated as exhortation. When God gives us this gift and it is active in the church, we are to encourage and exhort people to do what God wants them to do. It's not about platitudes. It's not even necessarily about feeling good. It's about encouraging people to do what God has put in front of them. If someone is dealing with depression or, or in a, in a, uh, being, being down or, or, or these kind of things, we go to them and we encourage them to know that they are not alone. 
that the Lord is walking beside them and that we care for them and are walking alongside them as well and so forth. There may be individuals who are struggling, but they know what they're supposed to do, but they don't want to do it. We walk alongside them and we encourage them and exhort them to do that. So that's really more how that gift functions in the church. There is an encouragement element to it, but it's not about platitudes. It's about pointing towards the Lord and serving him. Okay, the one who contributes in generosity. Okay, here is another generality about spiritual gifts. When God calls us to him and gifts us with his spirit, the spirit that is within us is the spirit that is within our brothers and sisters in the church. Now, that spirit may manifest in different ways, but we can be called upon to exercise all of these spiritual gifts from time to time. God may be the one who puts us in position to do that. It could be that we do not have the gift of um, teaching or the gift of evangelism, one of the gifts that's not mentioned here, but mentioned in another list. However, it may be that God has us talking with our neighbor when they are open to hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. And now the spirit is manifested within us and the gifting of evangelism and the gifting of teaching is happening there because it's the power of the spirit at work. We may not be called upon to do that all the time, but we're called upon to do it some of the time. That's the case with all these gifts. Take this one, the gift of generosity or giving. All of us are called upon to give to the mission of the church. We practice tithing, as, as we have discussed before. And I would encourage you to be a part of that if, if you are not already. However, there are some of us that are given this special gift of generosity. Um, and it, you don't have to be a wealthy person to have this gift of generosity. In fact, I've known people who are not wealthy who are very quietly behind the scenes just helping people out when, uh, when, when they need that help financially. But all of us are called upon to do that in some way or at some time. Okay, the one who uh, contributes in generosity and the one who leads with zeal. The word lead here can mean administer. It often refers to those who are leading the church, the elders or, or pastors. But it's not limited to that. If you lead a ministry in the church, uh, you are exercising this gift. Um, if, if God has uh, put you in position to help us, you know, we, we have a treasurer who uses his leadership uh, gifts as well. We have um, uh, 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 people that uh, officiate at business meetings who help us by using the gift of leadership. Uh, church council, when we gather together, those are our leaders who are leading different ministries and aspects of the church. All, all, all of these individuals are exercising that gift. Uh, and it may be that this is not something that God uh, has you doing all the time, but there may be a, a need for you to exercise leadership and, and God will give you the gifting at the time that you need to do that. And then it concludes with this, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Uh, is it only the people who are gifted with, with mercy who are to be merciful? Of course not. We are all called to be merciful because God was merciful with us. Um, it was the grace given to Paul that, that had him write this, and it is through the grace given to us that has us hear these words. No, we're all called to be merciful, but there are some of us who are really gifted with this. And we, we are able to perceive when people need mercy in a way that maybe is lost on the rest of us. And yes, I'm looking at you, Cindy. Um, some of us are, are just have a, a, an extra special gifting in this area. And what a blessing to the church when, when uh, people who need mercy are, are, are being helped by those who are just extra merciful or, or extra gifted in this manner. Okay, so here we have this list. It's not a complete list. Like I mentioned, there's, there's three other lists in scripture. Some of the ones that aren't mentioned here, uh, I, I did mention evangelism, that, that's a gifting that, that, is, that is listed elsewhere. Faith is one that's listed elsewhere uh, as well. Uh, the speaking in tongues is, is listed elsewhere. 
Once again, Paul tells us not to, um, not to uh, forbid that uh, in, in Scripture, but, but he does give a whole lot of, of sort of guardrails for, for, for that kind of thing. That's not something that's normally practiced in our faith tradition. It's not something that's necessarily needed as well. Uh, so we don't have a comprehensive list, but we do have a list. And, and there are generalities about this list that I keep returning to. Okay, they are given to us by God. These are not talents we develop. Okay, they may dovetail with other talents that we have developed, but this is a work of His Spirit in our life. And so it is supernatural, whether it is demonstrably supernatural or more of a behind-the-scenes supernatural. When we use our gifts, we are being used by the Spirit. And we are being used by the Spirit to build up the church. And this is why I include this this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, His Spirit is at work within you. You have been gifted with spiritual gift or spiritual gifts. If you are not active in a local church, though, your growth as a believer is stunted because you are not exercising the spiritual gift or gifts that God has given to you. Furthermore, the church is stunted in its growth because you are not there participating in the spiritual work that God has going on here. So I would implore you to become active if you are not in a local church, in this one or another one even. But be active in a church so that you can grow as a believer of Christ using your gifts. And so that the church can grow because the people in the church are using their gifts. Now, what if you don't know or are unsure about what special gift God has given to you? You might be tempted to think that, that there's nothing special about you at all. Okay, how do you discover your spiritual gifts? Let me tell you a foolproof method of doing this. First, you need to send off from my correspondence course Three easy payments of $39.95. No. Do you want to know how to find out your spiritual gift? Get involved in a local church. By being involved in a local church, by showing up, by being a part of a small group, by signing up to help out with something like the Paul B. thing we did yesterday, what will happen over time is this. Over time, you will start to get excited about some aspect of serving in the church. Uh, it'll, it'll just excite you. Uh, it'll animate you. It might be hard. It might be stressful. You might be worn out at the end of it, but you'll be excited about it. And other people will notice this. And they will come to you and say, I'm so glad you were with us today because you were such a great help. Or I am so glad to see you doing this thing you're doing. I think God has really gifted you in this. You're gonna get feedback from other followers of Christ. And when you do, that's the Lord speaking to you through them. This is how we discover our spiritual gifts. Get involved, say yes, and his spirit will help your spirit discover how you are to serve. Once again, let's summarize here. Spiritual gifts is the gift of God's Spirit to us. This happens when we become a believer in Jesus Christ. The different spiritual gifts are different manifestations of His Spirit. Um, we will find that we uh, have a manifestation, at least of one of these, something that the Lord is going to use for the benefit of the church um, but, but all these other gifts as well, there may be times where we have to exercise those also. If that's the case, His Spirit will help us to do that as well. And we discover this and we grow as a disciple of Christ when we are active in a church, helping that church to grow 
as well. Let us pray, everyone. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you for the many, many gifts that we uh, have been given through you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for blessing us. We thank you for, for saving us. And we thank you for bringing us into a church body and gifting us to help that church party and, and to grow in our, in our walk with you. Lord, we pray that you would help us as individuals to discover our gifts and to exercise our gifts. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to be a welcoming place for that to happen, dear Lord. And Father, I pray that uh, if there are people that are just maybe a little hesitant or a little afraid to, to commit to a church in, in, in whatever manner, that you would help them overcome that fear. Perhaps they've been hurt in the past. Who knows, dear Lord? Dear Lord, I pray through the power of your spirit that you would help them to overcome that and help them to engage. Dear Lord, there may be people, I'm sure there are people who are gathered here either in this room or via the live stream, this Lord, that, that this morning do not know this wonderful grace that you shared with Paul, this wonderful grace that you have shared with us, the gift of Jesus Christ and his salvation. I pray, Lord, if that's the case, that your spirit would speak to them, that they would be able to overcome their hesitancy and would reach out to you and be remade, have, have the weight of sin and guilt lifted from their shoulders and become new creatures in you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.